Oh. Okay. Hi, this is Martin Sadler from League Express, and I'm today with Richard de la Riviere, who also writes for League Express. And those people, those of you watching, will probably know if you read League Express that Richard does the Rugby League Heroes series of interviews with with great players from from days gone by in rugby league. And uh, we're at a notable juncture, uh, Richard, now because, of course, you're you've just uh, sent me number ninety nine which is uh, the great John Gray, who played for Wigan in the early 1970s, came from Coventry and then spent most of his career in Australia. But um, that's just the latest in a series of some really great interviews. And, um, you know, some of the ones recently have, have really excelled as well. Alan Hardesty this week, Ian Brooke the week before. But, you know, we've got a long history of them now. And I just wondered... You know, A, what gave you the idea of doing all these interviews? And, and B, which ones really stand out in, in, in your memory from the ones that you've done? Um, yeah, well, thanks firstly for publishing them and for you know, giving me the platform <laughs> to do it. Um, I think when I, when I wrote, when I, when I worked for you full time and I sort of wrote about everything, I think I always probably preferred writing about the history of the game because I was learning as I was going, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I didn't know a lot of this stuff. And I think I had more fascination in learning about it. And I think my my love of the current game has declined. I've got to admit that. Um, and I think I, I, I find myself getting more and more fascinated with the history of the game. When I used to do the On This Day column for you, I, I just used to learn new things every day. Mm. Things that I think would be bigger stories if rugby league was a bigger sport. Yeah. I don't think they do a great job of celebrating our history. Although, to be fair, you know, a, a lot of individuals within the sport do. And a lot of clubs uh, are doing a good job as well. But on the whole, I think our history tends to be neglected a bit. I, th I sort of think that in 1995, when, when we switched to the summer, we did it with the attitude of we're leaving the bad old days behind. And I'm not sure that yeah. was a very fighting technique. And I don't think it's also very fair to the history of the game. And, and well, we've great... always done that, Richard, haven't we? Because even in 1895, when we, you know, when we broke away from the Rugby Football Union, in a sense, a lot of clubs behaved as though they were starting again from scratch. And of course, they weren't. They had a great history prior to 1895, mm. some of them winning cup competitions and all sorts of things. And, yeah, uh, and that's our history. It's, it's yeah. our club's history. And it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's our history. And when, when I did my book, 100 Days of the Shook Rugby League, I, I made the point of not starting with 1895. I went back to 1888 with the yes. infamous Lions tour when, when Bob Seddon was killed, the captain, of course, he drowned in a boating accident um mm. because i just wanted to make that point that you know we we we, we should own that history that goes we way should. back clubs were first formed uh, so you're right it, it's an attitude that's always been there i always remember in about 2010 or 2011 richard lewis wrote an article for the sky sports magazine where he basically said you know summer rugby is amazing and it's you know terrible to think that we had all these years of fat guys wrestling in the mud and Absolutely. now it's all a yeah. bit you know tough athletic wonderful guys and, and there's nothing wrong with talking the modern game up no but you don't don't, you don't do it by, uh, you know, criticising the past. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's, it's in a very long-winded way to answer your question. I, I've, 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 I've learned as I've gone along. And even when I interview these guys, I, I read Alan Hardesty's book in preparation for the interview. And it was a wonderful book. It was written by his nephew. It was published yeah. about 20 years ago. And it's just a genuinely superb book and absolutely fascinating, really well written. And Alan Hardest has got to be one of the greatest players the British Rugby League has ever produced. He must surely be very close to being in the, in the Rugby League Hall of Fame. Yes. And, and, and you know, he, here's me who spent 10 or 15 years studying the history of the game. And, and there's an awful lot about him that I didn't know. So it was great to put that interview together. And, uh, yeah, we've had a lot of good uh, feedback from it, haven't we? Absolutely. Yes, yes. And, you know, we go back, I think the first player you ever did was Sean Edwards um, mm. some years ago now. And... Uh, you know, you, you, you've been doing them ever, ever, ever since. And um, I think the highlight, I mean, it's, it's difficult to pick out a highlight because every, every interview is so interesting in its own way. Uh, there haven't been any that I've, um, I've not enjoyed reading, uh, I, I have to say. And um, you've even done some um, interviews with people who weren't players. You know, the, the Eddie Hemmings interview, for example, was... Uh, was yeah. really fascinating, and yeah. uh, you know, I, and funny enough, I I, I met Eddie um, at a at a lunch um, just as uh, you know a week or so before that interview was due to be published, and he was absolutely thrilled to bits to uh, to have been included <laughs> in that in that series. And in fact, that That's was a 
a double header mm. interview, wasn't it? You know, you, you, you yeah, yeah, some so of them. Much I, to him. Some of them have been fa double -headed. fantastic, really. I, I always like to get stuff that somebody might not know. And the, the, the obvious example with Eddie Hemmings was he, he was actually at the High Hysel Stadium disaster yeah. in 85. He was a big Liverpool fan, but to, to come across somebody who was at something like that, you know, so I, that's just, a, you know, just a sort of thing I remember from. Yeah. From Other non-players. Well, I mean, Julie Burgess did play, but she's probably more famous for being mother of the four <laughs> yeah. Burgess, of a, a minor celebrity in Australia. And then, um, I mean, David Burke was a player, but again, better known for being a journalist. I, I really enjoyed yes. that. I could write lots of articles actually about journalism and how it's changed. And it was interesting to, to, to speak to someone like David. I'm sure you been, could, yeah. Writing the league for two or three decades. Um, Gemma Walsh was a bit different because she was a, you know, obviously a female player. So it's, it's, it's a series about retired players or, or whatever mm. role they do, you know. So obviously Eddie Hemmings had retired by the time I spoke to him, but, but Gemma had just finished playing with, um, well, she didn't actually play for St. Elders, did she? But she signed for them and didn't play. So yeah. it was fascinating to talk to her as well. Um, I think I think the best one, I always wanted to speak to Dick Huddett. That was sort of on my list of goals, really, as a rugby league writer. And he's you a fellow... did it just in time as well. That well, was, that's yeah, the point, I just did... before he died. I you know, impressive. what a remarkable man he yeah. was. Yeah, I there's the a few people that I need to thank for getting me phone numbers, actually. One of them is Gary Schofield, who's got me a few of his, his mates who I've interviewed. Mike Latham is very good for, for giving me yeah. phone numbers and suggesting people but the other one's a guy called peter hogan in australia who I, I haven't heard of but he's got a facebook group called former international greats and it's a fascinating facebook page really where people just put pictures up of old players and talk about oh. them and peter makes contact with a lot of these guys and he actually he put up a photograph of him just with dick hudder uh, looking through some scrapbooks on his settee one day about six months ago so i sent him a message straight away saying i'd, I'd love to speak to dick and and within 24 hours he'd sent me his number Marvelous. and said dick's for you to ring and I'd, I'd tried everything you know I tried Ray French for his number but Ray said he sort of Dick had moved out of Sydney a, a long time ago and wasn't really in touch with too many people no. Dick, Dick he sort of wander, wander around and, and and take photographs and, and draw the photographs that he took he was just um, a wonderful story it, it's funny you know because I remember reading about Dick Hudders in, in in a book um, called Never Before Never Again which was a book about the great St George team that won 11 premierships straight in the 1950s and 60s. And the, um, the author of, of, of that book, you know, made the point that Dick Huddett really had a wanderlust, really, uh, mm. and used to travel all over Australia yeah. with his paintbrush and easel, just yeah. painting landscapes, you know. Yeah. And, and that's, that was a fascinating thing for an ex, you know, big, yeah. tough rugby league guy to have started doing. And, yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. And, 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 and Dick just wasn't the sort of guy who could settle down into an ordinary life, suburban lifestyle. You know, that yeah. just wasn't for him. Amazing yeah, yeah. stuff, really. Yeah, but, but and, and, you, you know, you, you did that interview and he, I think he died just two or three weeks <coughs> later, didn't he? I think it was maybe maybe a little bit longer, maybe sort of six weeks, something like that. Yeah, we were, yeah. We had the two copies of League Express, didn't we? But I, but I remember thinking that he'd, he'd have received them and he'd have um, hopefully read them. Yes, but Dick, yeah, so yeah. But Dick was someone who I intended to keep in touch with and I, I, I rang him about three or four weeks after the I think I rang him about three weeks after and we just had a catch up mm -hmm. um but, but when you talk about the 11 straight premierships i think my favorite thing that dick said was i, I asked him who would have won a world club championship <laughs> game <laughs> we because saint helens won won a lot of trophies in 1966 and that was the year that st george won their last premiership and he he said without hesitation that st helens would have won even though he was a st george player yeah fascinating thing because it's not you know he, he, he you know i don't want to make it sound old martin but in your lifetime of course we have been the better rugby league country you know there's you, no you, doubt you, about it and in the 60s the ashes series and the world cups were 50 50 back then weren't they and um, and dick was pretty adamant that they wouldn't have had the players to deal with alex murphy and, and tom van vollenhoven the, the, the real match winners that the uh the saints had just to just to digress for a minute actually i was having a, a debate recently uh, via email with a, a, a very prominent former politician who's a rugby league fan, but I'm not mention his name. But um, he was saying, you know, we, we, we'll never beat the Australians until we learn to be, um, you know, to, 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 to bring more, what, what, what's, what, what, what's the right word? Make, make, make the game more demanding, really, so we can get up to the Australians level. And I made the point to him that, you know, we last won a major tournament in 1972, which was the last year before we split into two divisions and had a more intense 
competition, supposedly, with, with you know, a top division and a second division. And having done that, we've never won an international tournament since. In the old days, prior to 1973, we had 30 clubs all playing in one league. And, you know, every other week a team would play against another team that was of a much lower standard. And, uh, and yet we were able to beat the Australians in those days. Yeah. Strange, isn't it's- it? It, it, I, mean, it, 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 I suppose that's partly a coincidence because I think there were, there were a few tournaments where we were very, very unlucky in the mid. Oh mid yes, late. but we still didn't win. Yeah, but, but yeah, right. But but there the, 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 the had then clearly been a, a very obvious decline by say seventy nine when we lost thirty five nil, and then yeah. the eighty series against New Zealand's not great viewing really, even though it was a draw, and then of course eighty two. So so yes, there, there was a big decline. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. yeah. But again, going back to your, uh, you know, to, to, to some of the articles, I, I, I think you've, you, the, the, the great thing about them is that you, they are meticulously researched. And, you know, you do bring out some really wonderful things that, that, that perhaps were known, but not necessarily to that many people. You know, the yeah. story, for example, about Ian Brooke yeah. um, and playing in the 1963 Cup final, which coincidentally yeah. was my first at Wembley. And, I, you know, Ian Brooke has been a hero of mine ever since he scored that last try at Wembley. But what I hadn't realised was, of course, that another person watching that was his actual birth mother, uh, who recognised <laughs> recognized his father in yeah. uh, Ian, Ian Brooke and got in touch with the club. What an amazing story that is. Well, um, Ian's got Ian's autobiography is coming out soon, and I think that, that'll probably feature quite heavily. I'm so sure I'm, it I'm will, really, yeah. really looking forward to reading that, because, of course, in, in the interview sizes that we do, it's sort of one question, one answer, and then you move on. But even to get that in three or four lines, it's just an astonishing story, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. She, she was based down in Oxford. He was born in Plymouth. Yeah. Um, I, and that's incredible. And, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. But, yeah, I thought Ian's interview was great. I love the way it ended as well by saying, you know, we need more people to talk at Rugby League. Because one, one very common feature with these interviews is that the vast majority of people I speak to are thoroughly disillusioned with the game. And it's very easy to say, well, they're just a bunch of miserable old so-and-sos. But when we change the rules constantly and we change the structures constantly, we essentially change the sport and it becomes a very different sport from decade to mm. decade. Whereas football, for example, until VAR hadn't really changed anything in all my no. life. It's, been sport, it's essentially the same sport. But a and lot of football think... fans hate VAR, don't they? Well, Let's yeah, exactly. It. That's the first time football's done something like that, that then precipitates other rule changes to try and make something unworkable work. Mm. And, and we, we, we've spent my entire life as a rugby league fan sort of chasing our own tail, trying to catch up the Aussies trying to catch up with the union, whatever. And we just sort of, and, and, and so, I mean, it, it's not even close. It, it, the vast majority of guys I speak to just are very negative about the current game. And a lot, a lot of it I don't actually put in. It's just an off the record conversation with them. Do you think part of the problem though, Richard, is that once some of these great players retire, they then seem to be put on the shelf and ignored. And maybe they feel a bit resentful about that. I know I probably would do. You know, players, players who have, have achieved yeah. so much, um, mm. you know, and, 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 and ought to still be, you know, at the forefront of our thinking, really, um, particularly if you are interested in history. And yet all too often they're, they're ignored and we only hear about them many years later when they die, perhaps. And we run an obituary, you know, it, I mean, it, it's incredible, you know, the legacy that these guys have left behind them. And, you know, your articles have, have really sort of set that out I, I, I suppose and you know for, for, for so many of them I should think they you know they just must feel really great that you know they are being featured well, yeah, in, 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 that's in another the series. Reason, that's another reason why I've enjoyed doing this because when I worked for you as a journalist as a Super League journalist with a press pass phoning up players I, I'm look I'm not having to go at any player and I haven't really spoken to the vast majority of today's players anyway I mean I've stopped, I've stopped working as a sort of a genuine journalist in about what, 2012, 2013. But when you phone up a player, maybe it's different for you, but <laughs> you sort of get the impression that oh, it's a journalist. Okay, I'll yeah. give him a few minutes of my time, but there isn't that much enthusiasm there. And, you know, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm not very good at it or wasn't very good at it. But some of these guys, you know, I mean, Bill Ash, uh, sorry, Ray Ashby phoned me back a couple of times and I, I, I sort of, I, you know, he, he, he wants me to go down and see him and, uh, you know, next time I'm, I'm down there for, for, for a game and I'll yeah. gladly take on that. What a lovely fella. And so many of these, you know, 
I could, I could list the vast majority of them. We're just, we're just really, really pleased to do the interview. And just, well, having and said just... that, um, it's interesting because I've just been speaking to Brodie Croft at, uh, at Salford just, just before we're having this discussion. And I've rarely spoken to a player who's had more enthusiasm and, yeah. you know, been keener and been looking forward more to the next season than he is. He's, you know, what a great young, young bloke he is. So, you know, it, but you do get that sometimes. Not not yeah. every player, not every player wants to talk to journalists, especially in the modern era, when everything is you know digital, online, and so on and so forth. Yeah. They, um, you know, journalists have perhaps lost a little bit of, um, of, of 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 their importance as far as um, as far as well. Yeah, with, are concerned. With journalists in general. I'm not talking rugby league journalists. I mean, in general, journalists don't have a great mm. reputation either for things that have gone on, you know, with national newspapers down the years. Yes. And, and it, it's it's not a, it's not a popular profession and so, so I think there's an element of like to journalists but also the clubs I mean I really got the stage right you know the, the clubs would just be protecting their players uh, and, and not letting you speak to them and you think this oh, is yeah if you owned a if you owned a restaurant in town and the local paper wanted to do a feature on you you'd be delighted of course and you'd never you wouldn't in your right mind turn down that some sort of that sort of publicity but our no. clubs turn down that sort of publicity every single day and look i, I can't criticize the modern ones because like i say i i got out of it sort of five six years ago and just wanted to concentrate on writing about the history of the game uh because it just brings me a lot more pleasure and i, I speak to people who are actually enthusiastic and, mm. and want to and want to speak to you as well mm. so yeah that, that's, that's definitely uh, an issue yeah are there any players who have turned you down having said all that um i have to say some, some i haven't i haven't had many who necessarily turn me down but i i get a few messages back from people if i contact somebody for somebody else's number it, it, it's someone who's maybe um who, who maybe played in the 70s or earlier i do unfortunately get a few messages saying that you know that they're, they're, they're just not in a they're not well that you know there's an awful lot with with dementia of, of yes, some of course, yeah. uh, you know so we, and then obviously if, if that's the case and there's no obviously chance of doing an interview with them mm. um off the top of my head i mean yeah there, there have been a few but not not for any particular reason other than maybe they're just a bit shy and they're you know, they maybe yeah. had media work and they don't have to now so they don't really some, want so, to. some of them may feel as though they've just not got much to say i guess yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to sort of embarrass anybody by saying, but I've, I've had a, I've had a few. You know, mm. if, if I make ten inquiries, I might, I might get nine back that I can ring, and maybe one in ten I can't. But it, it, it's not for any particularly interesting reason. It's just oh, I'm not particularly keen to do or whatever. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and the ones you haven't yet interviewed, uh, Richard. Um, I've got one or two phones going here. The other people <laughs> answering them, but. Um, Hopefully they uh, hopefully they'll stop ringing in a moment. But um, of, of the guys you've not yet interviewed, are there any particular ones that you'd really like to get hold of and, and, and do a piece with? Well, actually, I normally go back quite a long time. But in terms of retired players, I'm actually quite keen to speak to Jesse Joe Parker. He's just retired. And right. I, it's just been in my mind, having read Stanley Jean's book and, and having believed that it's one of the best league books ever written, I, I just would love to speak to a, a Papua New Guinean about, you know, life in Papua New Guinea and playing rugby league in Papua New Guinea. So Jesse Joe yeah. Parker's a good one, so that'll be coming up. Um, I've got Tony Fisher agreed to do one as well, the great the great Welsh forward. Tony Fisher, my goodness. One heck now, of a character. Tony there's Fisher. a guy who will, will have some stories to tell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Roy Roy Dickinson's agreed to do one. Great, um, <laughs> uh, Gary Gary Schofield's agreed to do one. I've got I've got a number for Gavin Miller. I've not contacted him yet. A number um, for who? Sorry, Gavin Miller, who yeah. man of the match in the World Cup final in '88, played with Hull KR with great, great distinction. Great player, yeah. Um, you see, social media and and then calling people on WhatsApp makes phoning Australians and New Zealanders so much easier. You it know, does, it, yes. It's now suddenly free to call them, and it's also. <laughs> Come across them on Facebook, send them a message, and yeah, and they have to do it. So yeah, and of course, as I said, Pete, Peter sent me up with quite a few in Australia as well. Yeah, um, well, I look forward to reading all of those, but Tony Fisher in particular. Yeah, uh, I've yeah. got some <laughs> some great memories of him, and uh, you know uh, that that so Welsh front row when he was with Jim Mills. Gosh, that yeah, uh, 
Well, they stopped England <laughs> winning the World Cup, didn't they, in 75? If we'd been in the World Cup. 12-6 in, in Brisbane. England would have won the World Cup. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, those uh, in, in, in incredible times. But um, and of course, Tony Fisher played in that 1978 Dad's Army game when <laughs> Great Britain beat Australia at Oddsall, which was, uh, you know, a hell of a, a hell Tell of a me day. A story about that, weren't weren't you there? And didn't you watch Rod Reddy neck a pint before yes. the game? Or something? yes, Rod Reddy. What a yeah, yeah. We were just outside the dressing rooms that day, and. Um, there was a, a young Australian fan with a, about four cans of lager and Rod Reddy came out just before the game was due to start and drank all of them, <laughs> or virtually all of them. I don't think no he left we... much. <laughs> well, I, I interviewed Rod. He, he's one of them that we've done in this series. So um, Did you remind him of that? I, 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 might, don't, I don't recall not, you doing. I'm not sure if it got into the article, though. But some <laughs> I just suddenly remember that with you, with you telling, with you mentioning 1978. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Just to widen yeah. the conversation a bit, uh, Richard, you are a Workington Town fan um, for your troubles. You know, uh, probably not many people who combine a love of Workington Town with a love of Liverpool Football Club, but 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 you do. Um, but Workington are going to be in the Championship this year, and some of their games hopefully will be featured on the new Premier Sports coverage. In fact, the Cumbrian Derby will be on a Sunday night, which I'm cursing, mm. actually, because um, <laughs> it, it conflicts with our, our print deadline. Uh, but nonetheless, it's going to be great to see those, those games on, on Premier on a Monday night. And, and I just wonder what you think about, you know, the fact that Super League will be, or some Super League games will be on Channel 4 this year. Do, do you think maybe 2022, bearing in mind that it's a World Cup year, could be a bit of a breakout year for rugby league when hopefully your interest will be regenerated uh, in the game <laughs> and hopefully a lot more people's will be as well. Well, yeah, fingers crossed. There's a lot of exciting news going into 2022. I mean, we've said this about previous years and that we've not quite hit the targets we've wanted to hit. But I, I mean, like mm. everyone, I can't, I can't wait for the World Cup. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll have Premier Sports. I'll be, I'll be certainly watching the games involving the Cumbrian teams and probably a few more. Mm. Um, I am looking forward to the Channel Four coverage. I mean, I'll definitely, I'll definitely be watching those. I think that mm. the half twelve on a on a Saturday gives a, you know, adds another dimension, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's not, it just just remind me, half twelve. Half twelve on day, Saturday. They're they're on Saturdays, aren't they? Yeah, 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 yeah they are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's proved I mean, a very popular football. So yeah, well, it's a great yeah. kickoff time because it it actually allows you to um, watch the game. It's over at just after two o'clock, and then you can go out and watch or play an amateur game if you want to do that or if there's another game mm. on elsewhere you can still go out and watch it so it's it's a great time and one of the things that um, that was pointed out in our forum actually the, the totalrl.com you know fans forum was that you could conceivably sell a 12:30 slot on a saturday to fox sports in australia because that's yeah. 9 30 p.m in australia and a game there could be could be shown straight after their triple header of NRL yeah. games, you know, which would mm -hmm. perhaps give it some added value. So um, that's a an, an interesting thought if, um, if if somebody can can get that sorted out, you know, maybe for the following year, perhaps. Who knows? Yeah, I need to kick off a bit later because the Aussie Aussie games always seem to kick off when they feel like it, don't they? There's well, no they always of... seem to overrun a bit, don't they? <laughs> Because they, they their last game is on at ten thirty at our time, but it all seems to kick off at about ten forty or mm. ten forty three or something. So they're probably yeah. a slighter. No, but that's 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 a great idea, and, and they're, they're pretty attractive looking fixtures at first, aren't they? So yeah, yeah. Oh, I think uh, yeah. I, I, I certainly think so. But how do how do you think um, the, the you know having two French clubs in Super League is going to impact on rugby league in this country? Because you know, you are you are keen on history, and you know the history of French rugby league, and you know we've talked about it before. It's it's a tremendous opportunity for for the French game, and there's all this talk about France having a World Cup in 2025. Um, but it would be great to see Toulouse doing pretty well, wouldn't it? And the thing that worries me a bit is that I'm not sure that they've strengthened enough to really be as competitive as we'd like to see them. Yeah, but what, one thing that happened with Catalan Dragons was obviously they signed Stacey Jones and uh, in their first year, I think John Wilson, oh. um, Chan. They, they did sign good players from the 
NRL. But the key to their success was the fact that the French League was so much stronger than we realised. Mm. And I'd say three or four years before it kicked off, the Catalans, I'd say there was maybe only one or two Frenchmen that you would regard as genuinely top quality rugby league players, you know, proving themselves in Super League, for example, maybe Jérôme Guisset and maybe Fakir down mm. there. Um, but very quickly, as soon as they got the opportunity to go into that Catalans environment, the full-time environment, and, and playing under a guy like Mick Potter and playing alongside those NRL players, they stepped up very, very quickly. And yes. it, it, it was a it was um it was a stepping stone that was it was bridgeable. Mm. Whereas when you try to expand in other areas, the community game into the new expansion team has been too big a gap to be bridged. Mm. Um, but in 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 France, that competition, their local competition, is sort of championship or or maybe higher yeah. league one standard. And and back when when Catalans came in, I think it was a you know your average team over there was probably a championship standard team. So mm. I remember I remember Mick Potter telling me he signed a couple of guys in two thousand seven, and one of them was Cyril Gossard. And he said, oh, I'll just be a squad player. He won't play much. But because he had so many injuries, this was the year they got to Wembley. Mm. Gossard played for weeks and he was absolutely outstanding. Yes, yes. But that's, the guy, that's the guy who they didn't even think would play much. And then when Stacey Jones left, they, they tried and failed to get a replacement. Mm. And they sort of put Thomas Bosk there without really wanting to. And he was absolutely brilliant in 2008. You're absolutely right. I mean, it was, interesting, that, it was interesting to see in the recent France v England game that, you know, Corentin Lecam had a great game for France. You know, and yet he's only had one or two games for Catalans yeah. this year. He's that giant guy mm. who plays in the back row. But, you know, there's there's loads of potential there, isn't there? We, we should have gone there with a the second team way before now. But I, I'm not entirely aware of, you know, the finances and the business side of things. Mm. But in, in terms of just from a rugby point of view, that there's always been enough quality down there for a second French team. Mm. Um, the disappointment now is that Catalans probably aren't using as many Frenchmen as, as you would ideally as we'd like want. them to, yeah. Um, yeah. But, but in those early years with, with Mick Potter coaching them, I mean, they were using sort of 15 or more regularly with the amount of injuries they were having. Yes. And they were, and they all stood up as genuine. Well, even super- Paris Saint Germain used quite a lot of French players, didn't they? Back in the day. Well, I mean, they, yeah, it's. I mean, we're going back further then, and, and it was all a bit shambolic because they were having to play for their French team one day. And then yes, the exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Properly with Catalans. But <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, when, when, you know, when, when you ask me about that, the, the only thing I would say is I, I really hope that strength and depth in the French game is still there mm. because it, if it's how I remember it to be, then I, th- I think there's enough quality to keep both teams going. And well, I just I hope, hope so. that. Yeah, I hope so. And and you know the thing is that most people tend to point out that Toulouse as a as a major city has actually got the potential to be a bigger club than than, than Catalans. You know, because oh, economically, the, economically really small. But you know yeah. the, the the financial backing they've got there, they, they seem to have an absolutely great relationship with the rugby union club whose ground they now share. You know, there doesn't mm-hmm. seem to be any of the antagonism that there has been historically in France mm-hmm. between the two codes, at least in Toulouse. So, you know, yeah. they do have a fighting chance. And if they can really put a winning streak together, I think the sky's the limit in terms of the crowd potential they've got there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it might take a couple of years, but I agree with you. I think the potential's yeah. there. I've, I've been quite sceptical about a few of the expansion attempts that we've made. But, I mean, this isn't rugby league expansion. I mean, they've been playing there. No. The league in the south of France for decades. No, no, no. That... It's, I, I, think it'll, I think it'll work. I'm, I'm quite confident, quite excited about it. That's right. I just wonder, um, as we're talking about France, just just taking us back to uh, rugby league heroes. How many French players have you done? I can't, rem- I can't uh, remember you, just offhand. You've exposed a weakness there, Martin. My my yeah. A level French didn't do very well at it. Um, I uh, did Laurent Lewis, who was um, the first player on the first ever Super League team sheet, mm. fullback for Paris Saint Germain on That's that right. opening. Yes, I remember that. Yes, he he was a real good one. I've I've made a few inquiries and I think I've got one or two, you know, to to, to sort of follow up. So I'll yeah. I'll try and get done as 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 Catalans and Toulouse are getting underway. Maybe, maybe a good time would be when they're just about to play each other. Yes, yes. Well, Thomas um, Bosk, you've mentioned him. He'd be a good one, wouldn't he? Yeah, I remember Imagine. Bosk. Actually. His 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 English was quite decent when I used to see. He was one yeah. of the players I could speak to a reasonable amount. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, it, it, it would actually be good to maybe try and find somebody from the 78 team that beat the Aussies, perhaps. It would be marvellous, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because we hear, 
we hear such wild stories about what the refereeing was like and all these. <laughs> I know how much of this is true and how much. I, I don't think true. those games are on are on video anywhere, are they? I've I've never seen I've never seen video coverage of those games. No, I haven't, but I haven't looked for a while. No, but uh, yeah, I mean, even Alan Hardesty telling me that story that they, you know, the French turned off the hot water and took all their towels away when they beat <laughs> them. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. The stories about the French are absolutely legion. If we can just sort of, you know come to the end of uh, of this discussion now but I, the the thing that just um you know occurs to me is that there's got to be a book in this surely and uh, we'd obviously love to publish it if you'd be interested in doing so um yeah i mean well as i say we've, we've got a hundred but i mean I've, I've interviewed so many ex-players before i did this series you know when yeah. i edited the league world i did often had a, you know decent sized interview with, with an ex-player or players who are now ex-players mm. I've got I've got an awful uh, an awful lot of them. It could be a big book, wouldn't it? Um, That's it would either be one ginormous book, or possibly we could do it maybe club by club and have you know mm. Wigan legends, Leeds legends, St Helens legends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, mm. There's certainly scope for that. I think for the time being, I'll I'll plow on and see where I get to. Yeah, yeah, that would and, be great though if we can uh, do yeah. that maybe for next year at some time to yeah. perhaps to coincide with the World Cup. That would be a Mm -hmm. a, you know, a wonderful, a wonderful thing to uh, to be going on with. But anyway, Richard, it's been a pleasure to talk to you as always. Yeah, and, likewise. Uh, I hope the people watching this have enjoyed the discussion, <laughs> and uh, we'll have to do it again at some time. And uh, thanks once more. And I'll look forward very much to reading about John Gray in yep. uh, League Express this coming month. One of the more interesting ones I've ever done. So yes, absolutely. I, I an incredible fellow, it. actually. Yeah, an incredible mm. fellow. But um, thanks very much, and we'll speak again soon. Thanks, Richard. No problem.